this good? Okay. So um, we are, well, I'm Dr. Eric St. Pierre for you guys that might not have met me, but I think everybody knows who I am. I am the emergency room director at the hospital. And I'm also both director for ASI and Madawaski Ambulance. And the reason why we're holding this was to kind of inform you guys a little bit about how Pluribax function. If somebody, if you ever have to transport a patient on a transfer from one hospital to the next that has a chest tube, how the unit functions, what to do, what not to do, and what happens. So I will talk a little bit about the chest tubes and the reasons why you put them in and the basic physiology of what this little system is, okay? And then Ashley will tell you exactly from the nursing aspect how these things are hooked up, where things can go wrong, what to do, what not to do. Um, in the end, it's relatively simple and it should be pretty, maintenance, pretty well maintenance free, but there could be things, I mean, sometimes you guys might be transferring patients for, you know, three or four hours and there may be some things that you need to know that could happen that you might have to troubleshoot and that's where it becomes a little bit important to know what's going on, okay? So does that sound good? All right, good with you? Yeah. All right, so <laughs> just let's talk a little bit about chest tubes. Why do we put them in? And I put down probably the four more most common reasons why you're gonna be putting in a chest tube in somebody and really you're talking about pneumothorax, which is a collapsed lung, which is basically the air and then after that, you have a chemothorax, a pleural effusion, which is fluid or an emphyema. These are accumulations of fluid within the chest wall. So if you look, and this is kind of a very simplified diagram, but if you're going to look at your chest, inside your chest, you have lungs. The lungs have two linings to them. They have a parietal lining and a visceral lining, okay? The lungs themselves are like two, I guess, sponges that basically expand when you take a deep breath, and then they contract. And they're relatively elastic. So if there was not negative pressure around them, okay, so pressure exerting its force around them, they would have a tendency to collapse back into like a small sponge like this. So the goal is, is between this space and this space, there has to be a negative pressure. So when your diaphragm contracts and your chest wall muscles expand, you take a deep breath, you that will allow your chest to expand. And when it does that, it creates a negative pressure and there's kind of a little bit of pleural fluid around these two membranes here. It'll actually, that's to help it glide. The lung will then expand. And then as you exhale, it'll contract down. And there should not be any space between your visceral pleura and your parietal pleura in there. It should be just a little tiny minuscule space. I mean, I've kind of made it bigger than what it normally is just so you can see the difference between the two. But really what's in that space is just a thin, thin coat of liquid lubricant type thing to keep the lung being able to be fixed onto your chest wall when you expand and it closes. Where you end up with a problem is if you end up getting either air in that space or if you end up getting fluid in that space. So how can that happen? Well, there's kind of two ways. There's one way where the lung itself, which is actually kind of like a sealed balloon, like a, like a glove if you're thinking, like a, you know, your gloves that you wear for, for that. Uh, for uh, when you're working, that can pop a little hole in it, and then at that point, air can leak out of the lung into this space. That's one way, okay? Um, the other way is, let's say, you know, something that penetrates from outside, okay? So that could be a stabbing, a gunshot, uh, somebody penetrates their chest and they have an open wound coming from the outside, that'll let air in this way, okay? Or you can let have air come out this way. Either way, air is getting into this space over here, okay? And basically, unless this hole is much, much bigger than what your trachea is, then at that point your lung can still continue functioning some without having that issue. Where, where you end up with a problem is when you have a hole here and you have air filling up and the air cannot escape out. So every time you breathe in, it sucks in a little bit of air in and the air can't go out. So this space grows so this ends up collapsing this lung further, collapsing this lung further, and collapsing this lung further. Which you could end up having a problem called attention pneumothorax, which basically is that there's so much space that accumulates in this lung space here that it'll actually crush your heart and all your structures. You know, keep venous return from getting back to your heart, and people can die pretty quickly from that. So the goal is to kind of equivalent this pressure. If you have an open hole here, then all of a sudden the air will come out, 
Okay, where you have a problem is when the air comes gets sucked in here and can't go out is what it is. So that's that's kind of one of the big the big issues that you can end up having. Um, what's another way that this can happen? Like we talked about how you can end up. Let's say you don't have a stab wound in the chest, and you actually have a rupture of one of your alveoli or your bullae or something out of your lung that causes. How could you do that? Well, some people, if they're smokers, they have very weak lungs, and they can end up with blebs, and those blebs can suddenly just pop. And that will cause air to go out in here and accumulate again in here, and then there's no way for it to get out. And eventually that can become a problem for someone. So you've got to get this air out of here so that the lung can re-expand. Um, what's another most common way? Let's say you have somebody that you're intubating, and you're bagging them way, way too hard, and they have kind of restrictive lungs, you could actually cause a pneumothorax from bagging somebody too hard. And that can be really kind of dangerous because now not only, it's not only the person's breath type of thing, but you're even bagging even more air, so you have even a more likelihood of creating a tension pneumothorax because there's no place for that air to go. So this could happen, for example, let's say you're doing CPR on somebody, and all of a sudden, you know, you intubate them, and you're bagging them, and you're doing CPR, and your rib breaks, and it causes a puncture to the lung. There's no puncture to the outside, and now you've got a punctured lung and you're bagging them really hard and air is going into this space, that could create a really dangerous situation. So that's why it's important to always listen for breath sounds when you're doing this. Um, if somebody has a collapsed lung, will you have, um, okay, let's say I tell you that somebody does not have any breath sounds on the left. What side is the normal thorax? On the left. Okay, that's it. That's kind of something you've got to kind of remember. Um, so, when you're auscultating somebody, if you don't hear breath sounds on one side, that could be the side of the thorax. What else could cause a lack of breath sounds? That could also be common if you have an intubated patient. If you were the right stem bronchus. Okay, so if you put your tube all the way down the right main stem bronchus, because that has a tendency to head down on the right hand side, what side would you not hear breath sounds? On the left. On the left. Okay, so don't automatically assume this is a pneumothorax over there. In that case, you would pull back the tube a little bit and see if you get breath sounds again. If you continue to not hear breath sounds and you pull back the tube, pull back the tube, and the patient's in distress, that is an indication that they probably have a pneumothorax. The only time that you're going to decompress a tension pneumothorax or a pneumothorax would be as if the patient is crashing. If their blood pressure is dropping down below 80, if their oxygen saturations are crashing, if a patient just has a simple pneumothorax and they're not in that position, do not out in the field stick a needle into their chest. Okay, but if that patient, you don't hear breath sounds on one side, and that patient's blood pressure is going down, their oxygen saturation is going down, that's when you do a decompression. Okay, so that's just the basics of this. It's not the basics of this, but at least how that works. Now, what do we do in the hospital? if somebody comes in with a pneumothorax. What we want to do is we want to get the air or the liquid out of this space, the space between the parietal pleura, which is the outside cavity of the chest, and the lung itself. So how do we do that? Well, you have to put a tube in there, but it's not just as simple as just put the tube in and the air goes away and all of a sudden everything is great. That lung has to slowly rinse the air and the air slowly has to come out of there. So how do you do that? Well, just opening up this to the outside world will definitely help release some of the air. But remember, every time you're going to take a deep breath in, what's going to happen if your tube is just sitting there open? It's going to pull the air in. It's going to pull the air in. So you really haven't solved anything, right? I mean, you've released the tension pneumothorax because at this point you don't have an accumulation of pressure in there, but you still haven't gotten rid of the, you haven't given a chance for the lung to re-expand. So what you have to do is you have to hook your tube up and you hook it up to a bottle and actually it should go further down here, underwater, okay? So your tube will hook up to this bottle which will be sitting underwater. Why is that? Because you don't have enough pressure to suck the water back in but then it's not open to air. So I had a cup here. Did you see a cup of Right there. Okay, here we go. So let's show you the problem. So let's say this tube, chest tube, 
is sticking out of your chest. I breathe in, air is going in. I breathe out, air is going out. However, if you stick it underwater, if I breathe out, the air will go out into the bottle, okay, which is sealed. But if I try to suck in, I end up, oh, there's not enough force to get the water, but there's no air coming back in, is there? And, and just, there's not enough uh, pressure when you're doing this, when you're doing this to be able to suck water back up into the chest tube. So that's the point. That's the reason why you put this chest tube underwater. So she'll be talking to you about that. Whatever, what happens if this apparatus fails, you can simply just take your tube and stick it in a bottle of sterile water. And that will help at least not make the situation worse. That's one of the things you can do. But that's the concept between that. So initially, when they first came out with these type of uh, treatments, all you had was this little bottle here. But the problem is, is what happens if you have blood or fluid coming in? Well, now all of a sudden, this liquid is going to go up and up and up, and now it's not going to work anymore. So what they figured out is that they basically have this. Oh, sorry. That's what. No, that's because that's my container. This is the water one. This this used to be hooked up over here. So now what they did is they did. This is a collection chamber. Okay, is what they put in between the two. So. So in order to do this, what happens is this tube just goes here, this tube goes here. So if there's any blood or fluid, it'll get accumulated in here. The system continues on, and this is where it goes under water now. So before in the old days, they used to just put this like this where the water was, and then they realized they need a collection chamber. Now what happens if just the ambient air pressure outside is not enough to suck the stuff out of there, to suck the fluid out or even suck the air out? you got to add a suction container to it at the same time, which is why we hook this up to suction. And so now you have suction, so that actually increases the pressure even more and allows this to re-expand even more, okay? It, this is a very simple diagram, simple explanation. It's probably all that you guys need to know. If you really want to know the physics and the mechanics, there's about 100 YouTube videos that you can watch on this. It takes about 15 minutes to watch them, and they'll basically explain to you why this system works. So if you want a little bit more education, it's probably better to do this. But the general concept is you need three different chambers, is how it works. And this lovely little company here, okay, Fleurback, has put all three bottles in one thing to keep it simple for you. And that's what Ash is going to come in and chat about. So the concept is your chest tube is sucking air <coughs> in here and fluid. The fluid will end up getting accumulated here. The next part of it is your water drainage system, which is here. And then finally, this part is your suction bottle. So literally, this has three bottles in it at the same time. And that's kind of the way it works. And that is basic physiology of how chest tubes function. Your turn. And do you want the protector? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do is bring this down. So I just made a quick PowerPoint here um, about how to transport a patient with a chest tube. Um, it's this one. Oh, let's see. There we go. So I just wanted to show you some of the equipment um, along with this floor back instead of bringing a whole dressing cart here that you guys probably should have um, in your rig in case of an emergency. Um, like you said, the sterile water. I have here a bottle of sterile water, but I also have a Vaseline dressing here because you can have a failure with it um, coming apart but still being attached to the patient and that's when you would put it in the bottle but you could also like I don't want to say you get in an accident or anything like that or hit some horrible bumps where the whole thing comes off and comes out of the patient you want to cover them with a dressing but you don't want to cover it completely because if you cover it completely then they are going to have that you know tension build up because there's nowhere for the air to go 
Um, so normally we'd use a dressing and only tape it on three sides. That way when they take a breath, it sticks. But when they take a breath, it, you know, breathe out, then they can still breathe out. Um, so equipment, you want your chest tube um, inserted in the ER, hooked up to the drainage system. You're going to want your own portable suction in the right. So that way you can then connect it to yours. Uh, normally this really long hose is what's connected to the patient and this really short one is connected to suction tubing. So your patient will come with that suction tubing. I still want my own just in case. Um, but you would be able to, to do that in your rig and put it to the 20 just like we do at continuous um, and manage it the same way. Do you guys have suction on the wall in the rig or do you yeah. have a portable? You have, two. We have a portable in there. Okay. Good. Good. Um, so again, you want tape to secure your drainage system to the floor um, or on your stretcher, anywhere so that you can definitely secure it well. Um, and also tape for the patient because your dressing can always come loose at any time. Just because it was freshly done doesn't mean that they might have drainage right at the site. Um, especially if it's not an air issue and it's a fluid collection issue, that can saturate and then you're going to have leakage. Um, so you're going to want to make sure you have plenty of dressing for that. Um, the thick foam tape or the Metaphor tape. So that way you can keep reinforcing. I wouldn't take it off and make a new one. Just keep adding and adding to make sure that you um, the sterile water in case it comes off of the floor back, like I said, it was attached to the, uh, the patient and the gauze and the tea. Uh, during transport, you want to keep your drainage system below the chest level. Never bring it above the patient because you're going to end up bringing that fluid right back into the patient, um, causing a very big risk for infection and other issues. You don't want to tip it either because it'll throw off um, your suction and all the other chambers. You want to always keep it dependent and straight, um, which is why upstairs we usually um, tape it to the floor next to the patient. If they're sitting in a chair, we tape it next to them. If they're in the bed, we tape it next to them. Um, so it has this little leg here to make it so it doesn't tip over. Um, there's also hooks, so if you guys can hook it lower than the patient on your stretcher, I know there's not a lot of room between the stretcher and the floor in the ambulance, but that's also an option as long as you're below them. Um, I wouldn't lift it over them while they're, you know, so go from one side to the other uh, while you're in the rig. Uh, maintain the dressings secure with no leaks. Keep all the tubing looped together with no kinks and below the patient level. So um, you don't want half of the tubing to be on the floor. If you just loop it nicely, put it next to them, and then have it go down, it'll still drain well. Uh, don't clamp any tubes. Um, if you were to clamp it, you're going to do the same, the same thing as if they didn't have any air, area for that to come out. You're going to cause them that tension again. Um, you're going to want to monitor the bubbling in the chamber. That it continues to be gentle bubbling. Uh, means that there's a good suction seal. So you should have gentle bubbling here in your suction control. You don't want it bubbling like a jacuzzi because it's just going to evaporate quickly. And you're going to lose your suction. Um, it wouldn't hurt the patient, but you're just going to lose your suction quickly and they're just not going to have the best effect from the pleurovac. And you'll have to keep adding in here to bring it back up to the 20cc level if it's bubbling fast. Okay. So assessing a patient while um, you guys are on the road, you're going to want to listen to their lungs, both sides, compare them, make sure that they sound the same as they did when you left. Um, you're going to want to palpate around the site of insertion as well to make sure that there's no air leaks because if there's any chance that you, you know, hit a big bump and you feel like maybe something kind of got tugged, you might start seeing air leakage in their skin. Um, so cutaneous emphysema, you're going to feel that. It's going to feel crunchy. And you can also listen to it with the bell of your stethoscope. If you don't feel like you can feel it, you just push down and you're going to hear this crunchiness. Um, so it sounds kind of like Rice Krispies a little bit. Um, check all connections frequently to prevent anything from coming apart because again, you have a lot of options for this to fail. You want to make sure that these are well put on, that this isn't loose from your section because that's a time that you take it apart. Um, you can tape them if it makes you feel safer. Same with this one. We usually tape over this, um, this side and this side to the patient to make sure that there's no leaks. And you're going to want to mark your drainage level uh, when the patient arrives to you guys. So when you come in, you're going to want to know where they're at in the ER. So that way you can see how much they drain when they leave. Um, yeah, to monitor your output during transport. Um, monitor it frequently, note if drainage changes color or increases to over 70 an hour, um, especially if it's blood and suddenly you're draining immense amounts over a very fast uh, period of time. You're going to want to monitor the suction set level that it makes sure you make sure it's still at 20 and that it hasn't changed, that 
nobody accidentally hit the lever and it's going faster or slower. And you're going to want to monitor their oxygen saturation. Um, for troubleshooting, if excessive continuous bubbling is in the water seal, um, which is right here, water seal, you should have very gentle bubbling here. So this titles with how they take a breath. So if suddenly it's bubbling a lot, you're going to want to look for a leak. Um, and the only way you can do that is kind of clamp in different places down the tubing. Like I said, the take areas and stuff, you might have a leak there or at their, dr their dressing. So that's something that you can check. Um, you don't take something and clamp it for a very long time, but like I said, just a few seconds here and there, you can see if it stops, you can find where it's leaking. If you're just trying to isolate where it's leaking. Yeah, find like that area on the tubing or at the site. It could be at the site again if they have a really wet uh, mm -hmm. uh, dressing. Um, if the tube comes out of the chest accidentally, cover the site with the gauze pads like I explained, tape on three sides to allow the air to escape. Um, by covering the entire site, it causes pressure in the chest and can cause attention to pneumothorax. And again, if you have the other dislodgement where you're still in a good spot, you can use a sterile water bottle. And complications, um, like Dr. St. Pierre said, would be attention to pneumothorax can result from excessive accumulation of air drainage um, and can put pressure on the heart and the aorta. Uh, signs would be a fall in cardiac output, their blood pressure dropping, having distended jugular veins, absent or decreased breath sounds, a tracheal shift, um, hypoxemia, weak rapid pulse, tachypnea, dyspnea, or chest pain. What you would do would be, like I said, if they're very unstable like this, that you want to decompress the pressure of the needle and alleviate the patient's symptoms. And that's what I have on that. So does anyone have any questions about this chamber? The only thing I could think of that, um, I would think that you might want your own, only if they have a very big drainage going on, because this could fill up in four hours. It could. You should take a second. It's you should take a second one for one happens. if there's drainage, or two if, if you if this one fell on the floor. Yeah. You're going to want to take that, and I've had that happen before. We go set one up, and then someone turns around and kicks it on accident. Well, you can't use it anymore. It's done. You always want it to be upright. So if any chance of it tipping at all, even if it's below the patient, you're going to lose the suction. All of the bottles will not be So empty. it's no big deal to ask for a second. You can. Yeah. Just keep it in the sterile yeah. container, in the, in the wrapper, it's, and everything else, and when you guys get that, just... Yeah, yeah, because it's well wrapped. I, mean, I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, it would be a great idea. For sure. So, one more thing that we can probably mention is this isn't it, but let's say you had this was a chest tube that was sticking out. Some people get transported with just a Heimlich valve. Okay, and the Heimlich valve basically allows air to exit, but doesn't allow air to come in. So that might be something you might see at some point where a patient just gets transferred with a Heimlich valve. Um, that's one thing. So, if we were to kind of play a little game here. Um, and do that. Let's say you're working with a very novice driver who's trying to be helpful and grabs the thing and does this and puts it on top of the patient. You turn around and you look and you go, oh my god, what did you just do? What do you do? Okay, what do you do? I'll reach over and grab that. Okay. that. First of all, put it back down and take a look and see exactly what's going on with your system. Okay? So, you want to kind of see, was there a bunch of fluid in here or was there air? You want to see if the water level that should be at two centimeters here, is it still there or has it completely like gone back in here and now you no longer have this two centimeters of water? Because if you don't have that anymore, then this isn't going to work. Okay, so that's when you're going to need to switch it out. That, that part there is your, your little cup of water, right? This is your little right. cup of water. And, when, and what happens with these, I, I believe they, when you're first setting these up, they should come with a little bottle. It's like a stout, a thing that you can yep. put in. And a little in. bottle that has the exact amount of water and you put it into, where's your pork that you actually put it into? For this one? Yeah. You can pour into that. Is it, it into down? here? Yeah. Okay. And, you can, and that one's for this one. And okay. you can also inject through these ports if right. you want to just add. So if, you, if let's say your water evaporates below 20 and you're losing your water here, you can actually take sterile water and inject it. Oh, this is, this is where yeah. you add it. You add it in mm -hmm. here. So this is where you put your water in. So basically what you could do, if, let's say this whole system, you think it's messed up, okay? You got to have water in this line and you have to have water in this line. So you could take a bottle of sterile water. Do you guys carry sterile water? Yeah. You do. And you could inject it through this port, through a needle, and get it back up to here and back up to here. And then your system would still be okay. However, so saline bottles is fine, or does it have to be the water? Uh, it's just sterile water. It really doesn't. Yeah, they say sterile water, but I'm sure saline would be fine. It doesn't really matter, honestly, to tell you the truth. As long as you get, 
liquid filled up to here. It's not going to matter. You can put Pepsi if you want to. We recommend it. In general, the only thing I would recommend though is if somebody ever did this, you would let them know at the place because they're going to want to change it out. Plus, you've now contaminated your patient because now whatever was in here probably went back up this tube while this thing's going to see better days. Isn't it? So that's kind of one thing that, that could happen. Um, it's the same concept as if this thing just kind of tips over like this. Check it because things may still be okay even though it tipped over, but just you'll have to let them know when you get to that facility. The important things that she mentioned, mark before you leave how much um, accumulated fluid there is in here. And some people might even take a Sharpie marker and mark it right onto yeah, the thing that's what we usually with do. the time and date of where it was. As you can see with these numbers here, and I don't know if you guys can see at all, but they, they, they're they graduated in smaller grade graduations initially. So this, this goes to 200, but then the next one is 640, the next one is, so as you get more fluid accumulating, these chambers get bigger and bigger. So, because it's less important, this allows you to measure small amounts and then it will be bigger amounts as you go along. So that's one of the things that you can see with this. Um, as she said, and she was mentioning about bubbling in this chamber over here type of thing, you, you may get some bubbling in here because of suction. When you get bubbling in here, that means A, either you still have air in your chest and your pneumothorax is starting to go, or you have an air leak like this. This would be an air leak. <laughs> okay? So what she was mentioning, and what, what and it, was, it was good what you said, but sometimes it's not clear where you have to clamp. Let's say this thing is hooked up here. If you put your fingers here, or usually you have a clamp, like a rubber clamp that you can apply over here, if you do this here and it's still bubbling, and it's still bubbling over here, that means that your leak is somewhere this way. So then all of a sudden what you do, you go a little further down, you do this. Oh, okay, so I know that this part of it is good. Then I also know that this part of it is good. <coughs> Until you get to here and you go, oh, there's my problem right there. Now, you can, if you have some good tape, put this back together and tape it. Okay, if you, let's say you had a kink or somebody accidentally cut your tube, you could do that. As long as the bubbling's gone, the system will still work. And you'll have to change it when you get to your destination, but at least that's a quick way that you can repair these type of things. Um, another thing that can happen sometimes if you have a big hemothorax is you can get a bunch of blood that can accumulate in this and form a clot, which would completely obstruct this. Now, if it completely obstructs, obstructs this, what you're going to see is you're not going to get any more variability every time the patient takes a deep breath in here. Like usually when people are, are taking breaths or if you're giving positive pressure ventilations, this liquid in here is going to go up and down, up and down. And you'll see that before you take off. If this gets completely occluded, there's not going to be any more of that. So that's one of the things you kind of have to look for. Now the danger of an occluded tube is that now air can't get out again. So what's the danger? You could end up with a tension pneumothorax again. So if all of a sudden your patient is crashing and there's no air flowing to, through the tube, what would you do? Or what could you do? Are you able to flush that line? Can't really flush the tube out. It's really difficult. Can you change your suction? You could ch up change a little bit. No. Try that. No, probably not going to work. Use our second unit that we asked for. Huh? Use our second unit that we yeah. asked for. Yeah. Yeah. The tubing's all clogged. Can you change? If, if the tubing is clogged, you could try that. Yeah. But how do you know it's not clogged inside the patient? Worst case scenario, instead of sticking a needle into their chest, what you can do is you can just pull out the chest tube, cut the two sutures that are there, pull out the chest tube, and then put a three-way dressing over the area until you get there. Or you can stick a needle in the chest, to your choice. <laughs> <laughs> both, both will have the same effect. But if you really think this tube is clogged with blood and it's not functioning, you don't want to keep it that way. Okay? Because now you've now created, there's no way for that air to escape and your patient is going to start deteriorating. Obviously, you can call med control and say, listen, I think my tube is clogged. This patient, is, his blood pressure is dropping, the O2 sacs are dropping, what do I do? He's going to say either do a needle decompression of the chest, but that hasn't really solved much of your problem because that will only temporarily fix the solution. But if you pull the chest tube out and you leave a hole in their chest, you've now converted into an open pneumothorax. Can an open pneumothorax become a tension pneumothorax? Can an open pneumothorax become a tension pneumothorax? Suck in the air and if, it's, if they're sucking in air more faster than they're, okay. than they're pushing so it if it's a one-way flat 
type of open pneumothorax mm -hmm. maybe, but in general, could an open pneumothorax yeah. give you attention pneumothorax? Yeah. Say no. Okay. No. Okay. That was my second guess. And the reason being is that if you have an open hole, the reason why you end up with a tension in the thorax is because you have air accumulating in a space that's compressing all of your vital organ structures, is what it is. So in theory, if you have a hole to the outside world, that will never happen because the air should equivalent and you're never going to have that under tension. It's the same concept as if you bleed inside your skull, it's going to crush your brain and make you herniate, but if you have an open skull fracture and there's blood pouring, well, obviously you're going to die from the bleeding from blood pouring out of your head, but if that was open, then you'd have a place for pressure to escape. So as long as you have a place for pressure to escape, then that shouldn't happen. That's why you put a three-way dressing on there. But in theory, what could happen is that that area, because it's skin, could make like a rubber glove or could make like one of these where air goes in and it can't come back out. And so the answer is yes, an open pneumothorax could theoretically become a tension, but if that hole is freely communicating with the outside world, it shouldn't do that. It's only if air can get sucked in and they can't get blown back out. So that's the point. Now, with the, now, so what would, be, what would be another thing that you could do is, let's say this whole system or, or breaks down or something, what would be a quick emergency thing that you can do? Your chest tube is still working okay, you still have it hooked up to tubing, what could you do real quick? What was it that I showed you? Was so a just cup stick of water. it in the water. Just stick it in a bottle of sterile water. Okay, and then that way you can make sure 100% that air can't get sucked back into your chest through that. So if if I had a chest tube that basically looks like the system broke down or it came apart or you weren't able to get it back together again, just take the tube and stick it in a bottle of sterile water, and that will solve your problem generally. And we talked about hooking a suction up to the how. How do you know where to sit your suction? So basically what happens is there's going to be water in here that's right. going to be set at a certain level, which is going to be 20. Your suction to the wall should be set at 80. If you have a number, it's usually 80 is the minimum. Okay. And honestly, it's not going to matter because this part is what's actually going to control the force of your suction. So your suction is going to be at 20, but generally the suction on the wall can be set. As long as you get this up, get your water level up to 20, that's where you're going to want to be the majority of the time. So, so we can kind of play with our settings on our suction, yeah. so long as that's at 20, right. yeah. 20 cc. Because this is actually what's controlling your suction right okay. here, so that's kind of yeah, how it works. So, so that's it. And this, this here gets filled up to 20, and that's how you're going to kind of fill it up right mm -hmm. here. So I think that's about it. So I mean, the most important things that you got to realize is make sure this stays below the patient. 99% of the time you're going to be fine with just that. Where you may run into issues is if something happens when the patient starts getting combative, has a seizure or something, pulls a chest tube out or unhooks your apparatus, or if your chest tube gets clogged with blood or solution and then gets obstructed, and then what do you do in that case is what it is. So. Could you resection that tube ever? Yeah. Like cut it and then reinsert if, it? If you actually found the clog. Where the uh, clock is happening. The problem is you're going you're to risk introduction of infection. Yeah, if you do that, that's the reason why you really couldn't, you shouldn't do that. You'd be better off just pulling the whole tube out and just leaving it open and then just putting a three way dressing would be the best thing. So, you know, can you MacGyver it? You, you, you could, in theory. I mean, if I was out in the middle of a mountaintop or something like that, that's probably what I would do. But that's it. But, so. And like she said, 70 is kind of the number. So if all of a sudden you're starting to get more than 70 cc's an hour of blood, that's an indication to call med control right away because now you've got active hemorrhage and that patient is at risk of dying. Mm -hmm. so. One time I saw that was a patient, that was a patient who was stabbed. Stabbed, yeah. yeah and the, the drainage was okay. And by the time they came to the floor within a half an hour, um, it was increasing dramatically. There was, yep. Yeah. So that's that. Did you guys have any? Questions at all? Or? No? Okay. And I mean, if you get into a bind, you can always call my control. You, know, you always have that at your, at your, as your option if, if you know, you're, there's something that's not quite right. But I still recommend that even with our presentation here, go online to YouTube and just you know, take a look at the Pluribac system and get a picture of it in your mind of how it really functions on a real page.
information because right now we don't have it hooked up to anybody and you don't see what your values, your levels are and everything else. There it'll show you where the bubbling is and what it looks like and where the bubbling is here and what that looks like. Sound okay? Yeah. Is this helpful? Yes. Very good. Fine. Okay. All right. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.